Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to the kickoff lecture of what should be a spectacular spring lecture series on genomics, sponsored by the University's Consortium on Law and Values in Health, Environment, and Life Sciences. I'm Susan Wolf. I chair the consortium. Uh, I just wanted to briefly welcome you before handing things over to our true master of ceremonies, Kenny Beckman. Uh, this whole lecture series, uh, we are deeply indebted to Kenny, who is the director of the University of Minnesota Genomics Center, as most of you probably already know, um, and who has masterminded this wonderful series. We're also very grateful to two other co-sponsors of this series, uh, the Clinical and Translational Science Institute, CTSI, run by Bruce Blazer, and the University of Minnesota, the Masonic Cancer Center, um, directed by Doug Yee. Both CTSI and the Genomics Center are members of the consortium. I know that with President Obama's announcement of the Precision Medicine Initiative, uh, what we're going to talk about today, thanks to my colleague uh, Heidi Rehm, is right in the center of the bullseye. So thank you all for coming, and I'm going to turn it over to Kenny. Thanks very much, Susan. I think you're too kind, as always. We've already heard uh, about the co-sponsors. The title of the uh, series is Facing the Challenges of Genome and Exome Sequencing. And the three lectures we're having, uh, one today, will be followed by two more, one on March 12th and one on April 16th. And I'll be giving you a little bit more detail on those. So first, a bit about our uh, esteemed speaker today. Dr. Reem was trained at Middlebury uh, for a bachelor's and then spent uh, a number of years at Harvard University, where she got a PhD, and also a good amount of medical training, a master's of medical sciences. Uh, she attended medical school during the second year of, of, uh, the second year of medical school during her PhD, uh, followed by um, a fellowship at Harvard Medical School, uh, which resulted in her being a fellow of the American, um, Academy of, uh, American College of Medical Genetics. Currently, Heidi is the Chief Laboratory Director of the Laboratory of Molecular Medicine of the Partners Healthcare System in the Greater Boston area, uh, also known now as Partners Personalized Medicine. <clears throat> She's also an Associate Professor at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Harvard Medical School, and as we learned yesterday, also uh, on the faculty of the Broad Institute, which uh, her group is starting a, uh, a collaboration with that will grow uh, into... Uh, New, uh, new areas. Her lab, focuses, uh, her lab focuses are twofold. First, translation of genetic discoveries into the clinic and um, tied to that uh, overall arching goal, the bringing of new wet lab technologies and softwares uh, into clinical diagnostics to support that translation of genetic research into practice. <clears throat> so to foreshadow Heidi's talk somewhat, she told a group of us yesterday that one of her, uh, her team prides itself on providing the best clinical interpretation possible. It really stuck with me. Um, and she's widely regarded as a leader in uh, dealing with a tsunami of data that comes at you from next-gen sequencing and turning it into something that's actionable. And so it makes her a, a perfect speaker to start off this lecture series. Her lab's an undisputed leader in translational medicine. They've launched the first clinical tests for cardiomyopathy and lung cancer treatment. Uh, she and her team now offer whole genome and whole exome sequencing to support several large-scale genomic medicine projects, including MedSeq and BabySeq. Uh, and those are large evidence-based uh, projects to assess the utility, uh, patient and, and, and uh, doctor responses and costs and, and ultimately efficacy of using next-gen sequencing in the clinic. In addition to her work at Partners in Harvard, uh, she's also in service to the wider community in a very significant way. As a member of the ACMG Standards Committees, she's been active in defining community-wide standards for the use of next-gen sequencing. She's part, uh, one of the PIs of the NIH-funded ClinGen program, which is aimed at supporting the broad sharing and annotation of genotypic and phenotypic information, as well as clinical variants, and when not, Doing all of this and overseeing a 50-person staff, as she reported to us yesterday, she also conducts research into hearing loss, Usher syndrome, and cardiomyopathy, and has helped promote, develop and promote uh, software for uh, use, uh, software infrastructure for the use in a uh, clinical genetics arena. And that's been commercialized as the Gene Insights Program, which, uh, which has been, uh, which is widely known. 
Uh, finally, somehow, she also finds time to educate the future generations of, of, of a human geneticist as director of the Clinical Molecular Genetics Training Program um, at Harvard Medical School. Her talk title is Genomic Varianta Variant Interpretation, the Good, the Bad, and the Unknown. She'll speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a commentary by Bharat Thigarajan of Lab Medicine and Pathology for about 10 minutes, and I'll, I'll further introduce Bharat uh, later. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Please uh, silence your cell phones. I'll do that to mine now to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, those of you who are going to get CME credits, please fill out this form and make sure to turn it in at the registration desk in order for that to, uh, uh, to go through. And you'll also be mailed an evaluation form by email later. Please fill it in. Uh, uh, Susan will take your responses to heart uh, to improve uh, subsequent lectures and lecture series. And lastly, as this is the Joint Consortium on Law and Ethics, uh, we, we have to take financial disclosures seriously. So let me just read them out. Dr. Reem is, has consulted for several companies in the genomic space, including Omicia, Focus Genomics, Ingenuity, and Complete Genomics. And Dr. Reem's husband works at uh, Sanofi. Uh, Susan Wolf is a stockholder in Royer Biomedical and has also participated as a speaker at last year's Understanding Your Genome conference, which was jointly sponsored by the U and Illumina. And so lastly, I just wanted to add a personal, a personal note. We had a nice time, uh, those of us involved in the uh, joint MDL-MSI-UMGC clinical research endeavor here at the U, speaking with Heidi yesterday, and the mood was a little bit like, you know, the, the Little League team that has Babe Ruth come to town. We were excited to meet with her. Um, but a couple of things about that. After sharing, uh, some war stories uh, with her about the difficulties of genetic analysis in both places. I, I realized it's, it's not the Little League team. It's really more like a really good minor league team, which uh, is <laughs> hoping that, that, that somebody uh, gives us a, a local major league venue that's sent out to the administrators here. But, but more than that, um, it, it, it turns out that no matter what the scale of what you do, Baseball is baseball, and genetics is genetics, that it's, it's very difficult uh, to hit 1,000. Batting 300 is OK in research. It's OK in baseball. But it's not OK in the clinic, because each baseball represents a person. Each pitch needs to be hit out of the park. And so we're looking forward to having Heidi come and tell us about how she deals with, uh, with difficult pitches. Thank you for that kind introduction. I really did enjoy yesterday uh, the, the chats that we had sharing stories, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. In fact, to be honest, it's a real pleasure to be anywhere there isn't five feet of snow as there is in Boston right now. So I'm, um, I'd rather stay on for a few days and not go back to the snow, but alas, I will have to leave tonight. Um, okay, so um, as mentioned, I'm going to talk about genomic variant interpretation. I'm not actually going to spend 40 minutes literally going through the details of it, or you'd be asleep by the end, but really trying to contextualize it in sort of the genomic medicine context. And I'll speak about um, a variety of different projects that we have going on. Um, so um, as was mentioned, I, I direct a, a large clinical laboratory called the Laboratory for Molecular Medicine. In a, about a week, I'll also become the clinical director of the Broad's CLIA lab called the Clinical Research Sequencing Platform. And that's going to afford a lot of opportunity to consolidate um, activities and share uh, uh, really the, the strength of both orga organizations in terms of the technical aspects of the Broad Institute and the clinical interpretation aspects of my lab. So we're very excited about that endeavor. I think um, Kenny already read my disclosures. I also should add that I am an employee of partners which offers fee-for-service laboratory diagnostics through my lab and, and software, as was mentioned. So I'm going to start with this slide. It's a slide I put together for some discussions we've been having with the FDA about the regulation of genomic testing and, in fact, the regulation in the interpretive side that we've been brainstorming with them. You know, I really look at genetics and genomics in, two, in sort of three buckets in terms of testing, um, in terms of both the challenges and complexity of it. And there's the technical bucket, the sort of analytic validity. And you know, this is challenging because technology is evolving so quickly right now. And there is literally no limit to the content of what we put into tests. And, in, and really what we need are benchmarks in terms of best-in-class tools to really help standardize what's going on. Because right now a physician can't tell what's different about a test from one lab to the next. And they are, of course, constantly changing. 
And then you get to the interpretive side, which is the true bottleneck in genomics right now, is how we interpret the data we're getting. And there's enormous inconsistency of methods. And of course, not only is, is this a challenge, but really doing this well should inform the technical content of your test and what it should detect. So there's a huge interplay there. Uh, and then we get to the impact, or really the clinical utility, which we all need to do a better job defining the clinical utility. And for rare diseases, coming up with new approaches for how we can actually document the utility, despite the fact that a variant may be unique to a family or an individual. And there'll be no large clinical trial of that one variant. So how do we think about this in a broader context um, to help support the integration of genetics and genomics into medicine? So, with that as a backdrop, I'm really going to, as, as alluded by my talk title, focus on the interpretive challenges and what we're doing in this space. And I'll talk first about a large contextual project in which we are doing genomic interpretation. That's the MedSeq study led by Robert Green. And in this study, we are enrolling 200 patients, half with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, co-enrolled with 10 cardiologists half with, uh, who are healthy patients uh, enrolled with their primary care physicians. And then these individuals get randomized to either receiving whole genome sequencing or standard of care with just a family history taken. And then we issue a genome report as well as a cardiac risk supplement. Um, and the question is, you know, what happens? What do they do with that information? How do they perceive that information? Has it changed their care? Um, and we spent a long time trying to take the entire genome and consolidate the results of that into one um, page, and that's shown here on the left side, where we summarize both monogenic disease risk, carrier risk, pharmacogenomics, and blood type, all in a fairly simplified uh, structure. And then um, on the subsequent pages, which usually range from three to four to five pages, we then go into uh, detail in terms of the evidence for the variant's pathogenicity, what that disease is, because of course we're reporting diseases these physicians have never heard of, what the familial risk is, and provide all that information so that some physicians can go on and read that detail. Others might stop at the front page and refer to subspecialists. So we, we've, you know, formatted that result. So from the first 90 patients that we've reported on, we're getting near the end. Um, about 21 percent of them we have identified uh, dis actual disease risk for a Mendelian disorder. Um, if we use the ACMG guidelines and the list of 56 genes, that would only be one uh, on that list, but we are looking at 4,600 genes, so a huge expanse of Mendelian information. We find carrier status in nearly every individual, ranging from zero to seven variants reported per patient. Uh, and then for those in the cardiology cohort, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients, we find about half of them a cause of disease. Some in genes we recognize as cardiomyopathy causes, others in other genes. One patient diagnosed with Noonan syndrome who had no appreciation that they, that was why they had cardiomyopathy. So this is what we found to date, um, and this is a list of all the different actual Mendelian disease risk genes that we have identified. They range in their variant classification from very clearly pathogenic variants to those that we classify as likely pathogenic, which in our hands means really at least 90 percent confident that these are pathogenic. We also ended up exploring a category of return that it really is VUS favor pathogenic, and we subcategorize all our VUSs, which are a lot of variants, to those where we're more likely than not to think it's pathogenic. Um, and, and exploring in this, in this uh, research study what happens you return uncertain results um, to patients. So, so, of course, if you look at this disease list, these are all diseases where the range of expression of disease is quite variable and the uh, penetrance is incomplete. So it's not inconsistent with a patient who might show up assumed to be healthy to their primary care provider. Now, the interesting question is, OK, do we f actually can we find evidence of these diseases in these patients? And we are in the process. So this study is set up not to dictate the care of the patients, but to actually ask, if we return this information, what does a physician do with it? What does a patient pursue? So we intentionally are hands off. Um, we give it back, and we see what happens. In fact, we, we record the sessions, and then we track with medical records what actually is done, because we want to understand both the health impact, the cost impact, and things like that. So we are in the process of studying whether these patients have these phenotypes and what happens. And we are actually applying for a supplement to go back in after the study and deeply phenotype all of these individuals and figure out are they really evidence of some of these diseases. 
But so I'm not going to go through each and every one of these different patients, but I am going to bring up one case, um, which is sort of the opposite, those patients who don't get much return to them. And, and this is an example of one of those cases. And it really speaks to this question, can a primary care provider understand genomic reports? Because I can tell you there are not enough medical geneticists in our country to return everyone's genome report to them, nor genetic counselors for that matter. So how do we educate primary care physicians for this study? Well, the context here is that they get six hours of training, two hours of didactic training, four hours of case modules. They get CME credit for that. And so that's what all of the cardiologists and primary care physicians went through. And they, that training happened at least a year prior to the first disclosure that they were in charge of. So fairly base, basic information and training that they're given. Unlike most of our laboratory return of results scenarios, we, we are hands off in this study. We just send the report. We never communicate at all with the physician. There's no between the lab. Um, the physicians, however, have the option of contacting the Genetic Resource Center for assistance at their own free will. So we don't necessarily give it to them, but if they have a question, they can call a place. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we record those disclosures and we review what that information is. So I'm going to share with you one particular disclosure, and this is um, sort of the negative finding. So the uh, patient came in for their return of results, and the, and the primary care provider asked that patient what they might, might learn, thought they might learn. So the patient says, oh, well, only one thing that might be interesting, actually, my mother and my grandmother both had breast cancer, and my sister had breast cancer, and a bilateral mastectomy about a year ago. So that might be interesting from my daughter's point of view. So it turns out there is an intense family history of breast cancer, and in fact, the sister was a BRCA1 mutation carrier. And that information was never relayed to us when we sequenced the genome. So of course, this individual is looking at his report going, you know, looking for his results. And, you know, there it was, you know, no variants identified for monogenic disease risk. And so the patient said, I didn't have anything monogenic, which I thought was the main thing I would look for. So the question is, what does the primary care physician say to this patient? And this is much more challenging than those positive return results. And so, you know, we're listening, like, what is he going to say? And he says, don't assume that BRCA1 and 2 were checked here. Don't assume it. I would not make any assumptions whatsoever that this covered that. And we started cheering. <laughs> you know, it's like, he got it. He got it. Like, he understands this. So that was a win for us. You know, even just basic information like that to say, you are not out of the blue here. Of course, the question is, why was the PCP correct? And, you know, as some of you probably can appreciate, you can't assume that any given gene was fully analyzed, either by sequencing or by other analyses like copy number assessment, which is not routinely necessarily done in genome analysis. Nor, even if you have sufficiently covered for sequencing and CNV analysis, you can't assume that every variant in that gene was ever looked at. There's 5 million variants on average in a genome. We don't look at them all when we return results. So, so you cannot assume that he has been effectively screened for whatever his sister's mutation is. So, of course, it does beg the question, you know, we're excited about genomics, and what will it take to be able to re routinely relay what is not found in a genomic test in a clinically meaningful manner. That's what we're all after. It's certainly what I'm after. Um, and there's going to be a lot of things we still need to achieve to do this well, improve coverage of, of the exome and genome, improve detection of all variation. We mostly detect sequence variants in genomic analyses. We need to do a better job detecting copy number changes, big deletions and duplications, structural variants, triplet repeat expansions, like things that cause fragile X and Huntington's disease, um, uniparental disomy. So there's a lot of things we miss today when we do a genomic test. We also need to define all known genes and pathogenic variation for any given disorder. That's a big one. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about that. Uh, and then if you've actually done all the technical part and the interpretive part, we still need to define residual risks based on the elimination of known causes for any given patient. So that we have a lot of work ahead of us. We have taken some steps on the technical side. So for our exome sequencing, the first um, platform we looked at was 94% covering genes. So that's 6% of the exome missing. So we went through and did supplementation of capture probes. We were able to get that up on average to 98%, um, a pretty good improvement. Well, if you look at any given set of genes for a particular disease, you can be really poor. And in fact, for cardiomyopathy, we were only covering 88% of the known causes of that disease. So thinking about using an exome as the first test in a patient with cardiomyopathy 
very poor choice. However, with our capture probe supplementation, we've been able to get that up to 99%. And we are now, because we Sanger fill in every base that we miss in our targeted tests, we are going to do that for our, as we transition to exome for some of these targeted tests, now that we're down to a very small number of bases missing. So this is some of the approaches that labs are taking is really to try to enhance exome and genome coverage through supplemental technical techniques. Now on to the filtration and the interpretation approach. So for MedSeq, we start with 5 million variants in a patient. And the question is, how do we go from 5 million variants to a one-page report, and what do we give back? And how do we find things that are interesting and useful to the patient? So many of us take some sort of standard approaches, take databases like HGMD and ClinVar, which are, in theory, the reported pathogenic variants, and we find what's matching in a genome with a frequency filter to get rid of the junk that's in there, which is a lot. And then we have a novel loss of function predictor that looks for novel, you know, predicted truncating variants in genes associated with medical diseases, and then also a frequency filter to throw out the junk. And that, when we started this process, that would give us about 200 to 300 variants per patient that we would need to evaluate. Um, then we implemented several other filters to try to make our life easier. Um, the first one was just taking our own cases and eliminating variants that were greater than 10% frequency, because it turns out there's technical artifacts you see over and over again. And you also find variants that didn't map to the nomenclature used in databases and your, your uh, variant call file. So that reduced by 69% what we were reviewing. Then I told you earlier, we started with a list of 4,600 genes, every gene that's ever been associated with any Mendelian phenotype or medical phenotype for that matter. Unfortunately, there's not sufficient evidence for all of those genes to actually have an association. So we gradually excluded genes and we threw them out as we reviewed them and there was simply no evidence for disease association. So we'd build up that list and, and over the first 50 cases reduced by 13% what we're reviewing. And then there's the variant exclusion list. All those variants reported as pathogenic where when you review the evidence do not have sufficient evidence. So that list continues to grow. So at this point, after reviewing the first 50 cases, we got that number down to 10 to 30 variants per case that we were reviewing from this original list of 4,600 genes. From that set, then looking at what actually has evidence to be reported gets us to about 18% of those variants being reported in one of these three categories. We don't report the US favor pathogenic in our clinical service, but we do for the MedSeq study, as I mentioned. So that's sort of the process that we've been going through in reviewing this data. Now, will we ever get down to not having to review anything? Probably not. And this is data from about 10 years of testing for Mendelian rare diseases, about 15,000 probands across a variety of different genetic disorders, and looking at how often do we see any given variant found in, these, in this cohort. So if you look at that, about 17% 70 of patients have a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant seen 10 times or greater. So these things are easy to interpret. We see them over and over again. Uh, those are the easy cases. The problem is the vast majority of patients have very rare variants or uncertain variants that we see over and over and we still can't interpret. Um, and if you look at them, this is the no variant seen only once. So the largest, uh, largest uh, plot here which actually you can see I had to cut off, it goes all the way up to the next floor, are variants only seen once in one individual, never seen again. So there, all of us sitting in this room have variants that are unique to only you, and no one else has them. And so this is an incredible challenge to try and interpret this variation um, when it's so rare. And we will never, ever get rid of the intensity of variant interpretation. I know some days I thought I would get there, but no, I, I don't believe I will. So now, that said, we can, we can make it easier. And in fact, even though there, those variants were unique to my lab, if I were to combine with all the labs around the world, it wouldn't all be unique, right? So if we can just do a little bit of work in data sharing, we could actually help ourselves out. So, that is where ClinGen, and I've spent a lot of my time over the last few years in this project, first unfunded, now luckily funded. Um, and this project is now called the Clinical Genome Resource. And basically, we are focused on sharing genetic and health data through patients, clinicians, labs, researchers, any source of that information. And then we apply critical questions to that data. Is this gene associated with disease? Is the variant causative? Is this information actually actionable for patients? 
And through those questions and the curation that we do and support, we are arriving at a curated genomic knowledge base with the goal of improving patient care with this information. So that's a laudable goal. How do we actually do that? So there's a lot of people involved in this project. There are three NIH-funded grants. One um, that I have is a U41 genomic resource grant, two UO1s. We're working very closely with NCBI's ClinVar database that's been a critical part of this project. Lots of this funded by NHGRI at NIH. There's over 200 people from over 75 institutions involved in this project, a lot spread across a lot of different work groups covering many different areas of work with lots of people involved in it. There are people all over the world that are both working and sharing their data in this project. You can go to our website and learn about a lot of the different projects that we have underway. Now, some of you are probably familiar with ClinVar. It's a public database. It was launched almost two years ago now. And uh, when you go into that database, so keep in mind, this database is not a place to find truth necessarily. It is a place where we, sh we all share. So ClinVar does not curate any data. It just takes in data and shows it to the community. So you can go into a given variant, look up your favorite variant, and you might come to the clinical significance corner of the screen and see the answer is conflicting data from submitters. And then you go down here and you see, oh, one lab, GeneDX, said it was likely benign. Ambry says it's uncertain. So what's the truth? Well, we don't know, but at least you have a little more transparency to who's saying what, right? So, so that's the start. We need to be transparent with what we're all doing and identify when we have conflicts. Um, where is all this data coming from? It's coming from researchers, clinical labs, expert groups, clinics um, themselves, patients. We have a huge project getting all of Myriad's reports through all the clinics that have been testing patients. They are annoyed with us, but but it's working very well. 4,000 variants collected from Myriad through um, clinics. So we also work with lo locus-specific databases to integrate that data between ClinVar and those databases. To date, there's over 283 submitters that have supplied over 150,000 variant submissions, leading to over 77,000 unique classified variants. Very, very useful, I can tell you. Now, the question is, I told you ClinVar does not curate. There is data that's in conflict. So how, if you go into ClinVar, can you trust any of this data? Where does it come from? So we've worked very hard to set up a process to give some you know, insight into what data you can trust and what you can't, what you can feel more confident in. So we set up this STAR system, data that comes from practice guidelines that have always been very well vetted, give, are given four stars. How many variants do you think are in that category? 23, <laughs> the 23 CF variants in the ACOG uh, practice guideline. That's it. We are getting the CPIC, pharmacogenetic variants, will, that will be in this category um, coming in. in the, they're a work in progress. But there's not a lot up there. That's why it's the top small part of the triangle. We are supporting a process to allow groups that define themselves as expert panels. And so we go through a review process. There's a form you have to submit with your variant assessment method. Who's involved? It has to be multi-institutional, multi-backgrounds, clinicians, researchers, laboratory diagnosticians, all different people involved. And we will approve or not approve groups to be considered expert panels. When they get that approval, all their data can be classified as three-star. This includes uh, PharmGKB, Insight Colon Cancer Project, Enigma is applying for that for BRCA1. So these are groups getting this sort of expert panel status. Still a fair, it's only about uh, 2,500 variants in that category. Variants that have multi-source consistency with no conflicts get this automatic two-star when they're aggregated together. To date, we've then had the single submitter category, which is actually the vast majority of data in ClinVar, where it's just one group, anybody said anything, and they can submit it. Now, we've realized that there's a huge variation in that bucket, and so we've just now delineated two categories. The STARS will no longer be provided to those groups who just submit information without any criteria for how they evaluated their variant. So we've now separated. The red part is going to be launched in June. We're working with ClinVar to restructure the database, and we're going back to all the submitters and asking them to differentiate themselves. In this category, you'll have to provide your method for variant assessment. You have to attest to doing a comprehensive review of all of the evidence um, for that variant. And you have to be willing to either submit your evidence along with your classification or be available to be contacted and provided upon contact. In that case, once you attest to that and provide that, your method will be on, accessible on the ClinVar website so people can see how you classify your variants. Then you will get your star.
The rest will have no stars. So that will allow us to differentiate the vast majority of data that's currently in ClinVar. You can also submit data that has no assertion that's just, this was published in the literature and link that up. It doesn't apply to the star system. So this is how we're structuring this database to, to allow broad and massive data sharing and essentially crowdsourcing of curation, right? Because we cannot curate 150,000 variants in the span of a year. So let's let our community do it, but let's be transparent about it and let's show how people are doing it. These, I, 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 it's important to recognize all the labs that have donated this data. This is my ClinVar wall of fame. Um, it's actually on the ClinVar website in a slightly different format. But what you can see here is that there's a lot of data that's actually coming from clinical laboratories. And that is our major focus, because that's where things are being systematically well curated. Um, you can also see in this list, there's a lot of companies. This is not just an academic endeavor. There are companies that are willing to share their data. Ambry, GeneDX, and Vitae, Council, you know, these are a lot private funded, you know, commercial companies. So this is recognized. There's one notable absence, that's Myriad, but pretty much all the other clinical labs are sharing their data. So um, incredibly valuable project. So, so that's the good news. There's always bad news, right? Uh, so what is the bad news? Well, if you look in ClinVar, and I've sort of spent a lot of time looking in ClinVar, about 12% of those interpreted variants have more than two submitters. And of those, 21% are interpreted differently. And we're not talking like subtle interpretation differences like likely path versus path. We don't actually include those here. We're talking about the big steps, pathogenic versus uncertain versus benign, those three big steps. So I knew this was going to happen. Not everybody thought it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. Um, but it's important that it happened, right? Because now we know there's a problem, and now we can actually have an argument to spend some time solving it. So we are starting to solve it. We have a major project to go into ClinVar, find all those variants that are discrepant, and actually work to resolve them. So we've started doing this. Here's our work with both Chicago and Emory. We identified 104 differences across the groups. We simply shared each of our evidence with the other group. We both reevaluated. That cut us down to 28 that were different just by sharing data. Now, those 28 were now methodological differences, different approaches to variant interpretation. Some of those were around how you treat novel silent variants, what your frequency cutoffs are, you know, basic systematic differences into how we use rules to clarify. Those were all discussed, and we arrived at consensus for all, in the end, but one variant. And that was a variant where it was a GLA variant for Fabry disease, where people disagreed about the functional assay that was reported in the literature. And we decided we needed to go to experts to resolve that one. So it's actually a very productive activity. You know, basically 104 differences that we were able to resolve between three different labs. So this, this is what we are doing right now to try to work to resolve these differences. Of course, when you get to the methodological differences, the question is whose rules are right, right? So that's where we've been spending about two years, a group of us, trying to come up with better standards for the interpretation of variants. There's been a joint activity through the American College of Medical Genetics, the Association for Molecular Pathology, and the College of American Pathologists. And we just, about two weeks ago, after two years of effort, issued the final guideline. It is now on the ACMG website. Um, I would say a lot of these meetings did need and require alcohol in them. <laughs> Um, there is no truth to variant interpretation, and you can actually argue for days, weeks about rules. And the challenge is it's hard to say who's right and who's wrong. But we eventually came up with a rubric for classification of variants. This is a figure I put together to sort of bucket all types of evidence, and we would call different types of evidence in different strengths for pathogenic or benign, different whether they're population data, functional data, et cetera. And then we have a rule set for how you combine individual pieces of evidence and arrive at each of these categories. So this is you know, a fairly structured approach to uh, guiding variant interpretation. We do anticipate that over time, we hope groups that are working in specific disease areas and specific genes to have a little more granularity of the process. This is something we had to do fairly generically to cover all genes. But you know, what are the good functional assays? What are the absolute frequency cutoffs for different diseases? These things will be added to increase the specificity of this approach for different genes and diseases. But it's a, it's a good starting point. So then through ClinGen, we are now forming these expert panel groups in different disease areas. And in fact, although we 
made it a mandate that all data coming in would immediately be available to the public for absolute initial use, we then interface to ClinVar to then support the added curation process. So we are building our own system called ClinGenDB that can take in lots of different you know, private case level data, develop machine learning algorithms, all sorts of resources, and provide an interface for people to actually work at the data, find the discrepancies, resolve them, you know, work out all of that. And we have disease-specific working groups in all of these areas with others you know, over time being formed. This is just a few of our work groups, the cardiovascular disease work group, uh, the germline cancer work group, inborn errors of metabolism, pharmacogenomics work group. So these are all you know, the experts around the world working in these fields whose knowledge we can leverage to provide expert curation of this data. So you know, that's a lot of stuff about variants and what we're doing in the variant space. But it turns out there's a lot of work to just be done at the gene level. Um, so what are we doing there? And I'm going to give you a case example. This is a real case from my lab that illustrates the challenge that a lot of laboratories are facing today. So this is, was a seven-year-old male with profound sensory neural hearing loss, no family history, arrived at my lab, his sample for genetic testing. Many of these kids first get Connexin 26 testing. That was done. It was negative. And they went on to our disease-targeted panel called the Otogenome. So we, like you know, others doing testing here, we had our list of 71 genes in our next-gen sequencing panel. How are these panels created? Most labs go to the literature, do a search for every gene implicated in that disease, throw them all into a database, design your capture probes, validate your test, and launch it. And then you start getting results back. So this is one of the, this was a while back, one of the first cases. And what did we find? Two variants and two hearing loss genes. One was a frame shift variant. You know, those are usually easy to, to interpret. And then a missense variant. So we said, OK, what do you know about these two genes? Well, GGB6, and in the literature forever, OMIM gene reviews, hearing loss gene, right? You know, definite, both dominant and recessive, diagenic, also causes ectodermal dysplasia. But if you actually go in and read all those papers, which we do, um, there's pretty good evidence for hydrotic ectodermal dysplasia, many papers out there actually. But if you look at the autosomal dominant, there's one paper with one missense variant segregated in one family member. That's all the data there was. And there's actually on the Connexin database one other variant, just somebody stuck up there that segregated in a parent. That's the only data implicating point mutations uh, in dominant hearing loss. And then you look at actually recessive hearing loss. This has been around for ages. But it's all large deletions um, that encompass part of this gene and the thousands of bases upstream. And now we're finding deletions that don't even touch that gene. Turns out there's a regulatory element up here that probably controls Connexin 26, and that's the impact. And at this point, we think there is no evidence that GJB6 is actually has anything to do with hearing loss. Nothing in the literature that actually supports that. So why is this gene in our test, a do clinical diagnostic test for hearing loss? OK, gene number two, myosin-1A in OMIM and gene reviews, like all our trusted resources. And if you go to the one paper on this gene, um, first of all, the family that actually mapped the original locus was negative for this gene. And then they took a bunch of probands, sequenced them, and found a bunch of missense mutations and said, OK, it's a, it's a hearing loss gene. Then ESP cohort came out with population frequency data, and pretty much all these variants are very frequent, completely inconsistent with pathogenicity. Um, and in the end, it, some of these didn't even segregate in the other affected individuals. I don't know how this paper got published. But at the end of the day, there's no evidence that this gene causes hearing loss. Unlike most genes in this space, there's actually now a publication refuting the actual original claim. Most cases, there's no refute. It's just a bad paper that's out there for eternity. Uh, very frustrating. So this is happening left and right. In fact, we finally said, all right, stop, <laughs> go back, evaluate every gene in our test. We, in fact, at that point, there was 145 genes. We reviewed 54 of them with insufficient evidence for disease causality. It's a huge problem right now. You can just pick your favorite gene, sequence a bunch of patients, find a bunch of missense variants, and publish it as a disease-causing gene. So for ClinGen, we, we said, we've got to tackle this problem. I came up with an approach to define the strength of evidence for gene disease associations. And we, we have words, definitive, strong, moderate, limited, no evidence, disputed, or evidence against. And we are systematically 
going to support this in the curation of all gene disease relationships. And the idea from a clinical standpoint is then implement this so that if you're trying to return secondary findings or doing predictive tests, you should only use the definitive or strong genes, right? Now, if you're doing diagnostic panels where the patient actually has the disease, sure, you can go down to moderate evidence, but leave the limited and disputed for genome and exome when you're, you're already going in in an exploratory phase. Um, so that's sort of the recommendation you know, we're coming up with with how to use these levels. Although I will say, as a, when I put my research hat on, one approach that we've taken is to keep the probes in there to actually capture the data, but filter it in the clinical setting and then look at it and aggregate in the research setting where we can actually try to figure that out. So that is an approach we're taking to be able to continue to support the discovery process and sometimes move things from living it up, but still support an appropriate clinical test. Next comes BabySeq. We're now trying to apply this, um, these efforts in, uh, in a newborn setting. So the turnaround time gets a little harder. Um, and we've realized we have to do all our curation up front because we can't just spend time reading about genes while baby's waiting for its care to be dictated. So we're, uh, in fact, a fellow in my group has been curating 3,300 genes and also looking at all the most common presentations in the NICU and developing gene panels for all of those presentations and curating all these genes. So to date, she's gone through 1,221 genes using the ClinGen approach and defining what's definitive and strong, which we will use in the newborn sequencing, and throwing out the rest for these babies. Um, what the age of onset, we're only reporting pediatric diseases, and with high penetrance. So, that, so we've been doing this curation to support this project. We're down to 779 genes so far from the first round curation, but it's ongoing up to 3,300 genes. So, so that's great. You know, that's an application that we'll do with these curated gene sets. These will all be fully public and accessible to the community. But we also need to address collecting case-level data from patients. And just by way of an example, this is a case that presented in clinic, patient with distal arthrogryposis type 5. At the time, this gene was not ever discovered. The disease was described, inheritance pattern dominant or sporadic described. And we had a case with unaffected parents. We assumed it would be a de novo mutation, sequenced the trio, came up with two de novo variants, one quickly ruled out. The other, however, it's a mechanosensitive ion channel. Could it be causing this disease? I don't know. Every one you sequence has one, on average, de novo variant. It doesn't mean this one's causing that disease. We need more cases to be able to prove causality, right? How do we do that? And, and you can speculate as much as you want with functional data, but you will not prove causality with just hypotheses. So the traditional approach, phone a friend, <laughs> find another case out there. And that is, in fact, what we did. We phoned a friend who did functional analysis on this gene. Turns out another friend phoned him, and they connected us, and two cases were married together. We had enough evidence to, pu to publish this. It is the cause of this disease. It was a discovery made. But it only happened because that other case that was in Canada that we just got lucky. Um, so how do we do that it's more robustly? There are many cases sitting out there unsolved with candidate genes, and we need to bring these cases together. So we developed the concept of a genomic matchmaker. We all, I gathered everybody I knew who had a database in the world at ASHG about a year and a half ago, said let's figure out how to combine and integrate our databases so that we have patients with overlapping phenotypic features, overlapping candidate genes can be brought together in a mathematical algorithmic way. These were many of the groups that assembled. They all had databases. None of them were connected. So we said, well, how are we going to connect them? We could put all the data in a centralized place. Who wants to be the central matchmaker? Me, me, me. Everybody wanted to be the, the database. Not going to work. So um, stimulates, doesn't stimulate innovation. Regulatory across countries, you can't move the data. So that wasn't going to work. We went with a federated network. This is a big concept being promoted now, is to really develop federated networks to share data. Um, and now there's a lot of issues you have to uh, deal with in this space. I'm going rapid just to finish on time. And we started working with the Global Alliance. Some of you may have heard of this organization. Lots of um, institutions around the world coming together to develop standards for genomics and health. I sit on the clinical work group, but there's a lot of people, hundreds of people involved in this effort to develop standards. And we brought this project and said we need help developing standards for, for this federated network. So we've been working with them, and we have developed the Matchmaker Exchange Network. We have now connected multiple databases through common API linkages and others. These, the ones in SolidLine, are already launched. 
the ones in data line will be launched in the next few months, and we're getting this project off the ground and creating interfaces for people to go in and actually search and make matches. The interfaces haven't yet been built, but the connections are, are now live. We launched a website called Matchmaker Exchange. You can go there. Be careful if you Google Matchmaker, you may end up in other places. <laughs> perhaps more interesting than our database. But anyway, there is a little bit of information about this. We also have recently launched our patient registry for ClinGen called Genome Connect, where we are helping patients phenotype themselves and share that data. And of course, many of you have heard about Obama's initiative really to set up a voluntary national research cohort of a million or more patients. This is going to have to be done through a federated network as well and allow us to share lots of data and patients. So it's, it's an exciting time to think about this. I'll end just acknowledging, of course, this work is not all my own. Lots of people in the Matchmaker Exchange, the MedSeq Project, the BabySeq Project, ClinGen, you can tell I spent a lot of time on conference calls. Um, <laughs> and I will end with, uh, if you're interested in learning more about ClinGen and what we're doing and data sharing, please come to our conference in May. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. That was fascinating and extremely impressive work. Um, I'd like to introduce Bharat Thigarajan, who's going to be our commentator. I think most of you know him. Uh, Bharat is a uh, physician scientist with training in epi and lab medicine, and he focuses on molecular and genetic pathology. He joined the U as an assistant professor in 2007 in lab medicine and pathology, and was appointed director of the Molecular Diagnostics Laboratory in June 2012. Uh, he's established the Clinical Genomics Corps along with our group and scientists at MSI, the risk group within MSI, in order to develop infrastructure for clinical genomics. That collaboration has allowed efficient utilization of the resources that they have, as well as those at MSI and in our core, to implement next-gen sequencing-based testing for clinical diagnosis. Uh, we currently offer, or his group is currently offering a test for 4,800 genes involved in a wide variety of inherited disorders uh, and targeted oncology panels as well that are run uh, strictly in the MDL. His research efforts, uh, on top of this clinical work, focus on studying the role of mitochondria in the etiology of breast and colorectal cancer. Bharat. Uh, thank you for the introduction and then uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, the work we do here in Minnesota. Um, so I'm going to uh, give a perspective of how a small, uh, relatively small uh, molecular diagnostics lab um, implements uh, next-generation sequence-based testing for clinical diagnosis. Um, so when you talk about next-generation sequencing in a clinical lab, it comes in several flavors ranging from uh, targeted disease-specific panels, and these, the size of these panels can range from uh, you know, a single gene uh, to a few hundred genes. And on the other extreme are the whole exome, whole genome uh, kind of uh, approaches. Uh, the whole exome uh, approach is an agnostic approach. It neatly sidesteps the need to completely understand all the biology so you can identify, potentially identify all variants, all pathogenic variants. Um, that's the good news. You can identify all pathogenic variants. Uh, the bad news is, well, you'll identify all pathogenic variants whether you like it or not. Um, and so, uh, and, and that, that's the challenge. You know, you're going to find a lot of secondary findings uh, that may not be related uh, to the primary uh, reason why you are doing a sequencing test. Um, and the secondary findings are a big challenge when you want to try and incorporate uh, next-generation-based sequencing tests in a clinical lab. Um, so how do we deal with this? Um, the primary way uh, we deal with return of secondary results to patients uh, is through an informed consent process. Uh, that's been the cornerstone. Uh, through the in, uh, informed consent process, we hope to educate patients uh, regarding the risks of genetic testing and the benefits, the benefits and the risk of genetic testing, and hopefully uh, help them make an informed decision about how much information they want conveyed back to them as a result of this testing. Um, the problem is uh, the implications for the secondary findings are uh, complex and uh, span a wide variety. I mean, it can range from 
uh, implications for uh, genetic discrimination based on your findings for life and disability insurance uh, to the consequences of or the implications for uh, testing of additional family members. Um, and the complexity of this information is reflected in the fact that, uh, you know, the genetic uh, the consents uh, for whole exome, whole genome sequencing, on an average, they are over 1,100 words uh, among the six uh, major clinical labs uh, that provide this testing. Some of the lo um, uh, longer consents are well over 3,000 words. Um, so that gives you an idea of the complexity and the two other pieces that play into uh, the challenges of providing informed consent are um, health literacy of our general population and the amount of time a patient spends with a clinician in a clinical, typical clinical encounter. So by health literacy, what I'm really talking about is the ability of patients uh, to obtain, process, and understand health-related information so that they can make an informed choice. Um, and the health literacy of the US population uh, is on the lower side. Uh, <laughs> and this is reflected, uh, you know, um, in, in May 2013, there was a New York Times article saying, um, I mean, that reported that, you know, Angelina Jolie had uh, undergone uh, a mastectomy because she was a carrier of the BRCA1 mutation. Well, subsequently, there was a survey done on 2,500 people, and 75% of them knew about the story, knew that Angelina Jolie had, uh, had best breast removal surgery, but only 10% of them made the connection that it was a BRCA1 mutation that caused, uh, uh, was the reason why she underwent the surgery. Uh, so that gives you an idea of uh, where health literacy is uh, in the U.S. general population. And the second uh, point here is um, uh, time uh, required, time spent in a typical clinical encounter. So again, a survey of uh, more than 2,000 cancer patients showed that on an average, cancer patients spend uh, 23 minutes with their clinicians. Um, and so uh, our ability, our lack of ability to convey complex uh, uh, genetic information in a short amount of time is a real challenge uh, that needs to be addressed. And there are several groups working on how to simplify this process, how to make it more streamlined or provide kind of tiered approaches. Um, uh, but that is a big challenge uh, for clinical labs that want to get into the space of uh, you know, large-scale genetic testing. Uh, so moving beyond uh, informed concerns, you know, what can clinical labs do uh, to try and address this problem of secondary findings? Um, so clinical labs, you know, we need to take a step back and ask, under what situations would large-scale genetic testing provide uh, maximum clinical benefit. Uh, so when you talk about, uh, think about the uh, of the, uh, uh, what we have to look in this space, there is with large-scale genomic testing, with whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, the potential is that you would improve the diagnostic yield of this test, uh, of diagnostic yield in being able to detect pathogenic mutations. The downside is you're going to find a lot of secondary findings that you don't know how to interpret. Um, so in this regard, you know, uh, uh, some of the experience that we've had in Minnesota is a little bit instructive on how we would like to proceed forward. So we have been offering genetic testing uh, since uh, August of 2012. Um, and since April of last year, we have been offering 4,800 genes. During this time, uh, the numbers, uh, so for when you talk about a specific panel, a retinal disease panel or congenital eye disorders, the sizes of panel uh, during this time frame has increased from 20 genes to 40 genes. Right now it's at 175 genes. And when we went back and looked at our diagnostic yield in that how many cases did we actually find a pathogenic mutation, our diagnostic yield throughout that period has actually remained fairly stable. We identify... 
uh, pathogenic mutations in 60%, 70% of the cases. Um, when you look at the numbers of variants of uncertain significance that we have identified, we went from an average of 1.75 uh, uh, variant of uncertain significance with the smaller panels to uh, uh, 5.2 on an average, 5.2 variants of uncertain, uncertain significance. So this is an example where our, si our ability to sequence has, has improved, so we sequence larger amounts of data. Um, our diagnostic yield has remained exactly the same, uh, but we are creating more uh, problems by reporting more variants of uncertain significance, threefold more. And a similar, uh, uh, we have had a similar experience when you look at neuromuscular dis disorders. And here we do uh, sequencing in the context of research studies. But as our panels have gone from you know, 50 genes to 200 genes to 600 to 2,000 genes, our diagnostic yield has actually remained constant at around 30%. And then when you look at the published exome results for neuromuscular diseases, when you do exome sequencing, the diagnostic yield remains constant at 30 to 33%. Uh, but uh, the time we spend looking at all the stuff we don't know how to interpret has grown exponentially. So there is a place for whole exome sequencing. Um, but I think the clinical labs have to put it in context of their particular clinical practice and then evaluate uh, what's the optimal way to implement whole exome sequencing in a clinical lab. Um, so in, in conclusion, uh, you know, next generation sequencing uh, has already changed the way we practice uh, clinical medicine. Um, it's changed it here uh, at our institution and also nationally and internationally. Um, but, you know, beyond just the technical improvements that we need to make, um, uh, you know, there are regulatory issues and reimbursement issues that need to be addressed to be able to fully uh, get the advantages of large-scale genetic testing. Um, a good example is, you know, we probably spend more time trying to build for some of the genes we have sequenced than we actually spend time sequencing these genes. Um, and so uh, that's a real challenge for at least for uh, uh, clinical labs uh, that want to operate in this space. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, genomic sequencing is not an end in itself. It's really a tool that we have to figure out how to use to improve health of our patients and our communities. So in this context, figuring out ways to convey complex genetic information uh, in a straightforward way to patients and clinicians um, is critical to the uh, you know, ultimate success of integrating uh, genomics into our healthcare system. Um, and I think the work done by our speaker here today really uh, uh, is important in moving that thing forward. So, thank you. Thanks, Bharat. Um, we're now going to have a, a Q&A session. So, Heidi and Bharat, if you want to take your, uh, your places. Heidi, we thought we'd have you sit in the middle and Bharat, maybe this closest chair, and I'll, I'll sit in the chair there. We're going to have an usher who will be bringing a microphone around, and I'll try to take questions from both sides. Um, I could wait until the end for this, but I, I, I think in case people leave during the Q&A session, I wanted to point out that uh, the next talk in the series is going to be by Dr. Rex Chisholm, who's the Vice Dean of Scientific Affairs and Graduate Education at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern, and also the Chair of the Electronic Medical Records and Genomics Network, also known as eMERGE. His title uh, is Progress Towards Personalized Medicine and the Challenges of Integrating Genomics into Electronic Health Records. So moving on from this idea of how you interpret variants to then how you store them uh, in an in a electronic medical record format. The commentator next time will be Dr. Pamela Jacobson of the Department of Pharmacy, uh, who's also the director of the Hughes Institute of Personalized Medicine. I'm Bill Oting, and I'm in College of Pharmacy and in College of Biological Sciences. So when, when you think of when a doctor takes a, uh, like a glucose test, and they misinterpret it, and they tell the patient the wrong thing, they're, they're going to be liable for that. But when someone takes a look at this kind of information, and a doctor misinterprets the data, who's really liable? Is it the bioinformatics people, 
who are calling out those particular variants that the doctor is going to have in their hand, or is it the doctor who misinterprets or um, gives the wrong information associated with, with that information? So, I, I mean, at the end of the day, in my mind, I, I think I ha mine is working. Um, the, whoever signs out that clinical report with the interpretation on it is responsible for everything that happened upstream from the time the sample arrived in their laboratory. Uh, and that includes, you know, as a clinical lab, we oversee the validation of our bioinformatic pipelines. We oversee the validation of our technical assay. Even if you send out for a component, of course, some labs will outsource a technical component or even the bioinformatics, you are still, as whoever signs out that report, responsible for what has happened and ensuring the quality of it. Um, now, when you get to the point of the interpretation and what you write in that report, you be wrong for two reasons. You could be wrong because the data that supported that was fabricated in the literature or, you know, there's just data was incorrect or the way we as a community interpret it today is not outstanding. Um, we used to say that if a variant was absent in 100 individuals, it was therefore pathogenic. That was the standard. I don't know who did the statistics on that, but that was a poor decision. But that was the community standard at the time, right? So I think, you know, if you write a report and you interpret it based on professional standards, and any of your colleagues looking at that report would say, I would have said the same thing, then I don't think you're going to be liable for the fact that, that it might have been the incorrect interpretation. Um, now, if the physician misinterprets what was in that report, um, again, it's what is the professional standard? Did they act according to the professional standard or not? So I think you know, it's, it's like many aspects of law. Did you you know, operate in the expected, you know, standard at that time. And if you did, then you hopefully won't be liable. If you didn't, then you, you actually did a poor job. You didn't bother to look at what is standard evidence that we all look at. Then I think you should be held liable. And I see terrible reports that get sent to me for reinterpretation, and I'm, you know, appalled at the lack of quality of that interpretive process. So I, I think there are challenges there. Um, some, there will be liability that could be assessed, but in other cases, we do the best we can, and as long as that's the standard. Is that, I don't know if that answers well, the question. Well, the bioinformatics pipeline, that's, that's going to change weekly. I mean, it, it's, it's a moving target, and so yeah. what's happening on one clinical lab is going to be completely different than another clinical lab. I mean, it just seems like it's a real issue when you get up to 5 million variants, when you get up to 5 million variants, who's going to sign off that 5 million variants were ascertained properly? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question, and, you know, it's interesting. You know, years ago when we first started using more automated approaches, there was this assumption that when the bioinformaticist tells you that this pipeline will pull out all variants in database X, you just assume that that works. <laughs> and then later, like, you get data back, and a whole series, a class of variants was missed. How did that happen? And you realize the importance of validation that you need to have a data set that you understand through another method run through there to make sure that what co comes out the other end is, is what you expected. And so that validation process is critical. You may change over time and being able to document that this is the version of this we're using, and then if the version changes, you need to revalidate. I mean, yes, I agree with you that it's a moving target. It's constantly evolving, but when we document our methods, we have to say what we did. And that may be different across laboratories, but if it's accurate with respect to what we did, then, then I think it's okay. I think you know, my, one of my first slides up there where I said we need benchmarks and we need you know, best-in-class tools. They are not defined today. It would be nice if they were. What is the minimum standard? What is the minimum coverage an exome needs to achieve to be a clinical test? There is no standard today, right? So there are vast differences across laboratories, things that you can, you can understand from the methods and things that you will not understand from the method description. And, and that is a challenge. And so I do think we need to try to make benchmarks and establish what is the minimum. At the same time, we cannot hold and lock down and not allow innovation and allow improvements to be made. And that's where I think there's you know, just challenges. Yeah, I'd just like to add that, you know, going back to your glucose analogy, there are several methods to measure glucose, and we don't ultimately hold the 
technician who's running the glucose responsible uh, for the misinterpretation. And I think at the end of the day, any genomic test you do say, is a lab test at the end of the day. And the pathologist and the clinicians uh, own the test. And we have to be held to the same standard as a simple glucose test. And uh, complex as it may be, um, uh, just as Heidi said, I mean, we do clinical validation and we do to the best of the ability at that point in time. That's going to keep changing and we got to keep revalidating re and do best practices at certain points in time um, and then go from there. Brian? Um, Brian Van Ness, uh, the Genetic Cell and Development Department in the medical school. Um, I think this is an appropriate follow to that question then. What are your thoughts about the FDA's promise to regulate laboratory diagnostic testing? Do you think, A, it's appropriate, and B, at the level that they're proposing these regulations, have they gone too far? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, and it's a tricky answer in the sense that I, I do support some additional regulation. Um, you know, having observed a lot of direct-to-consumer testing environments that are, I think, are not as well regulated as they could be, tests that are just poorly interpreted actually causing harm to patients. So I think there does need to be additional regulation. I think the question is how to not um, uh, suppress innovation and to ensure that the cost of that regulation to the laboratories who are running low volume tests that don't have you know thousands of dollars to apply for you know FDA approved you know processes you know where's the sweet spot in, in protecting patients but not creating such a burden that you you actually suppress innovation in genetic testing and allow us to develop the best tests for patients so I think that's where there's a lot of dialogue is People are probably aware of a lot of public meetings that have been held very recently to really discuss all of these complexities. Um, and I think, you know, in my conversations with the FDA, I do feel that they, they have so far been focused on attacking the highest risk arenas and allowing the lower risk arenas to, not, to, to continue as is and coming up with ways where we are likely to register, self-register our tests and their existence and documentation, but without having to file enormously expensive applications for FDA approval. But it's still very unclear to all of us exactly where it's going to end up. And so we're all very concerned and cautious about the regulation that's coming. At the same time, I, I, do, I am in general a supportive of, of increased regulation. It's just trying to hit that sweet spot that I think is challenging. The other thing that, that we have talked at length with the FDA about is when, if and when they are positioned to evaluate a test application for FDA approval, and they're looking at the interpretive process that a group has come up with, they're struggling with how to review that. You know, if a lab says, this is how we review variants, do they say that's good, is that bad, and, and what do they point to? And, um, and so they've talked to us about ClinGen actually being a source that, that laboratories would point to to support their interpretive process. Um, but we are still in the infancy of developing curated knowledge to support this. So you know, one of the reasons that in Obama's list of four items, you'll see uh, millions of dollars to the FDA to support curated databases, that is exactly related to this dialogue that we're having about the need for these to help support these tests that are going to be requested for FDA approval for clinical diagnostics. One of the dangers may be that the FDA is going to require certain platforms that are that are approved, other platforms not as much, yes. or may not be approved, and, and it means that um, there are going to be some big winners, and then there's going to be some big losers that, that don't use the FDA-approved technologies, even yes. though they may be perfectly accurate. Yeah, so this is a, a big concern that, that a number of people are raising, which is they've written, if you read the, the draft guidance that's been put out, one of the things they've stated, to, in, I think an attempt to allow innovation and not over-regulation, is they basically said, if, one, you know, if, if a test uh, becomes FDA approved, 
then other tests for the same area need to also be FDA approved. And you might sit there and say, well, that's actually a, a, a reasonable approach to, you know, if everybody agrees that they don't need to be and they're operating fine, don't attack it. But then if some group says this one, you know, we're going to invest money to get it FDA approved because we think there's a high enough volume, and then that sort of sets the standard. But here's an example where that goes awry. One well-funded, large, you know, deep-pocketed molecular diagnostic company gets exome sequencing approved. Now everybody has to have it approved. That would be very traumatic to all of us in the, you know, an academic setting trying to offer well interpreted, you know, clinical grade exome sequencing. So that's just an example where an intended regulation might actually go awry and not achieve its goal. And so I think these are, these are challenges that we're all concerned about as we try to decide, are we for this or are we against this? And, and how do you achieve, you know, equipoise? Phil Peterson, a physician from the medical school. These are terrific talks and I can see where the excitement is tremendously in the research arena. Uh, the question I have is in terms of, uh, are we ready for prime time for the clinic, uh, for primary care doctors to uh, just do this, these tests, uh, whole genome sequencing, whatever it is, on all healthy people that come into the clinic? There are authorities that think that this should be done uh, for everybody, whether you're looking for a cause of a disease or not. So. From, from my understanding, it's not ready for prime time yet. Uh, there's it's still a lot of research that needs to be done. And in terms of educating the general public, uh, my own sense is not yet, in fact. We don't really know enough yet. The research has to be supported tremendously to see the benefit. Yeah, and I would have to agree with you. I, you know, we are doing these studies to try to understand what happens when you throw this into the clinical arena. But I would agree with you that it is not ready for prime time. There's not enough consistency in how we interpret that information. There are a lot of VUSs, variants of uncertain significance, being sent back, leading to a lot of people getting clinical evaluations for these VUSs that, are, that is, in fact, increasing healthcare costs. Now, there's also, on the upside, there are patients whose lives are beneficially impacted by this technology. Um, and so I am both a supporter but a cautious you know, advocate for it. And I th in my own personal opinion, I, I see it applied in specific clinical settings where there is demonstrated utility um, in making a diagnosis. Um, but for the average healthy individual, I do not think we're ready for that. And that's my own you know, opinion about that. In fact, I was, you know, for the, one of the Illumina Understand Your Genome events, the first one, I was asked to speak at that. And then we all had the opportunity to get our genome sequenced for five thousand dollars, and I, I said, well, first I said, guess because I'm a speaker, aren't you going to give it to me for free? <laughs> that didn't happen. Um, and then, I, and I basically said to myself, you know what? I'm not going to spend five thousand dollars my own money because a, the technology is constantly evolving. I don't need it right now, and I'll bet you there's going to be nothing useful found in it, you know, in me today as a healthy individual. Um, so. I didn't pay my $5,000. I actually went to the event and brought one of my patients' genomes that they had sequenced for clinical reasons and used that as sort of my, my genome for that event. Um, however, my genome was eventually sequenced for free through the Personal Genome Project. Um, and sure enough, there was nothing useful found in it, at least from that interpretation. So I, th you know, I think that's where we're struggling today is the technology is constantly evolving. So this notion that do it so that you have all the variants ready for when they're needed, well, those variants aren't the full set today. You know, we're not able to detect all variation, and the variants we are calling, not all of them are actually real, and we, we sang or confirmed variants, and, and they don't confirm. So, you know, we're, we're not there yet. I don't think it's ready for prime time, but I do believe in five years it will be. So, you know, is it five years? Is it three years? Is it 10 years? I don't know exactly, but I think we'll be there soon enough. Perhaps do you want to add anything? Uh, I agree uh, with Heidi's response, and uh, you know, how we have approached this, at least here at the university, uh, is actually we work with very uh, specific group of clinicians, very particular, uh, with particular specialities, where we believe that uh, genetic testing will actually improve clinical practice. And 
for better or for worse, it's actually very difficult to order this test on our current EPIC system. <laughs> um, um, and, I mean, it wasn't by design, but you know, it's. Um, <laughs> um, um, the, the, we've been very cautious in approaching and rolling this out in the clinical world, and we've stayed away uh, from even offering things like the medical exome or the whole exome sequencing uh, so far, uh, mainly because we are not sure um, how we are going to handle all these issues, uh, uh, you know, the secondary findings. We know exactly what to do with the primary findings, we just don't know what to do with the secondary findings. And we are working through the process with the clinicians. And I think uh, each healthcare system will find that sweet spot at different places, depending on how our clinicians are willing to use the information to improve their clinical practice. So. Do we have another question from no. the side, in the back? For those of us not in the medical field, uh, can, you, can you state your name and well, Sorry, Les Everett. I'm on the St. Paul campus. Um, for those of us not in the medical field, how do you think that FDA should deal with consumer services like 23andMe and their advice? Um, you know, I think, in, in my mind, 23andMe spans a couple different topics. One is, um, I do believe that patients and individuals have a right to their genomes and to the information within them. Um, at the same time, the approach that 23andMe took in terms of direct interaction with the consumer completely left the physician out of the game. And I think to then enable the application of that information in a clinical setting was completely a non-starter. Um, and there, they are, you know, the, the information that's being returned spans um, both traits, and I think I think it's kind of fun, and I, I, I think it's a great teaching tool for us to understand how our traits are based on genetic information. And I, and I think that's that sort of recreational genetics, I don't find a terrible thing. At the same time, they're also returning clinical information, carrier status, risks for at least the Ashkenazi Jewish BRCA1 and 2 variants. And, and that information is returned outside the setting of clinical care provider, where it cannot be contextualized and you know, assisted in sort of using it. You know, I, I had my 23andMe results done. I have, you know, sensitivity to warfarin. That information is not in my medical record. It, I, you need a username and password to log onto the website to find that information. So if I show up with stroke in the ER, that warfarin result is not there in my record, right? So, so I, th I think that um, I'm not completely against the testing and what's been done, but I think it needs to incorporate in the healthcare environment so that the information that is medically useful can be utilized and the information that's not appropriate and not medically useful shouldn't be in there. Uh, so I think there's still a lot to be sort of regulated in that space and trying to separate the recreational side. Because I, I can tell you, you go in there and say, oh, look, they got it right. I do have brown hair. I am short. I do have freckles. I like, wow, it's so accurate. Now I look at my cancer risk and do I believe the same thing? Right? So I, I think these need to be a bit separated. The one thing I do think 23andMe has done an outstanding job that I think our medical profession has not done a good job is how to communicate complex information and allow an interface to go back to that information. You think about the average you know, visits you have with a, with a healthcare provider, which as Barack says, 23 minutes for a cancer physician. When patients walk out the door, how much do they retain of the information told to them by a physician? Very little. How much do they remember about diagnoses? You ask for a family history, what is remembered? I don't know why grandma died. I don't know why my mother you know, was in the hospital last year. I, I don't even know why. I don't even remember that I was in the hospital last year. You know, like We don't have a good way of having useful medical records that transfer with us wherever we show up in the healthcare system, and that somebody actually explains that information in useful ways to us. So I do applaud some of the direct consumer groups for at least trying to provide, you know, I can go log in any day to my 23 results and go back and get an explanation for my genetics. I actually discovered that I was lactose intolerant that I was actually dealing with issues with my physician, changing birth control pills and all things for the stomach issues I was having. Got my 23andMe results. 
actually understood adult onset lactose intolerance, solved my problem. That was quite useful, right? So like there, there's some utility there, but it's just we have to try to figure out which aspects of that need to be incorporated in the healthcare environment, learn about some of the educational approaches that have been taken, and actually apply them ourselves. But we need a little more, I think, regulation and guidance to do it a little bit more appropriately. Hello, I'm Yinan Khan, a, a student from UFM. So my question is, um, so I think the challenge of um, diagnostic testing is to validate the, um, the um, uh, validate the uh, interpretation of of genome sequencing data. So, um, so I recently saw a protocol that uh, you can establish causality um, just with one patient with sequencing data, one patient plus a genetic modified cell line. So, uh, my question is, do you think it's worthwhile to like to validate a fraction of, of your data just by making genetically modified cell lines in a wet lab? So you're saying um, that you would, I'm not sure how the genetically modified, you're saying introduce mutations yes, into the say, cell um, line. Say if you suspect that like um, patient mutation is causing the actual disease, you can introduce that mutation into a healthy cell and see if that cell can give you the expected phenotype of that disease and uh, establish a causality just with this data. Uh, yes, yeah, so now I'm following what you're saying. So I do actually think some uh, newer approaches in more high-throughput functional validation of variation are absolutely going to be necessary. And it actually speaks to you know, the issue I raised where so many variants are unique to individuals and families that there will never be literature on your variant that you see you know, in a particular patient. So how do we go about figuring out what the effect is? And I think that will come from a combination of of true functional, whether it's iPS cells or other you know, uh, assays that can accurately validate the function. Now, there are, there are many genes and proteins where there is no assay out there. You know, how do you prove a variant is causative for autism? Like, what's the cell assay? <laughs> so you know, like, this will work in some settings, and, the, and it will be a successful model in certain venues. It's not going to solve everything. So, so absolutely, I think these are approaches that some people are taking. Um, to try to develop more robust methods for functional validation of variation. Um, but it's still going to be a long time coming for, to address all variation. Thanks. Betsy Hirsch from Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology. So in the current medical paradigm, in, in most situations you can get a second opinion in a case of whether you have a tumor, the tumor slides can actually be sent, your tumor pieces to another pathologist. You can carry your x-rays, your scans. Um, what if you want a second opinion on a sequencing test, especially an exome? What, I mean, you, you can't just repeat it. <laughs> um, so what do you think the laboratory should be able to share so that an individual can seek a consult, because so much goes into that bioinformatics piece um, that it may not, other than the re final report, what can the laboratory share with that clinician or that patient so that they can seek a second opinion? Yeah, yeah this is an active dialogue right now, is the return of genome sequences to patients and physicians. And we're actually in the middle of a survey through the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research Network of all both CSER sites and clinical laboratories, what their policies are on return of raw data to patients. Um, and interestingly, a law was just passed uh, and launched in October, I think it was, um, where laboratories are responsible for giving those results back directly to patients. Now, there was controversy over the interpretation of that. And what does that constitute? Is it just the report or is it the actual raw data? And um, it is my understanding is that the intent of that law was, in fact, the true raw data. And so laboratories are probably going to be in a position to be sued if they refuse to give this data back. Um, so, th so that's one paradigm, is the legal paradigm, and what that evolving landscape is. Um, but then there's the, the second side, which is what a laboratory is doing today, irrespective of legal. And, and uh, actually, some of them are returning it, and some of them are not. We, we ended up with a policy where because um, I do feel that a patient who gets their genome sequenced in my lab, 
has a right to that data and has a right to take it to another lab and get a second opinion. I absolutely believe that, given that I firmly understand that there are differences across laboratories, and I also recognize that there is no limit to the amount of time one can spend interpreting the genome. So it is an arbitrary decision-making point of when you stop. <laughs> so why should a patient have to stop wherever I chose to stop? And what if somebody else is willing, free or paid or whatever, to go further? They should have the right to go get that done. Right? So what we've made the decision is we would give back a genome. Now, what we were challenged with was, what state should we give back that genome? Um, and how do we ensure the limited risk of harm? So for example, if I you know, give a VCF file, variant call file, it's a list of variants that we've detected in our bioinformatics pipeline. They are not all real. There are, you know, variants have been called, particularly indels, that aren't real. So if I give a patient their VCF file, that can be opened on a text notepad reader, and they can get those variants, and they can Google them, and they can find all sorts of things. I'm not so sure that's the best approach to support. So what we decided was we would give back the FASTQ files. You can, you can find bases in there, but there's not much you can do with them as a patient. And the only way they're going to be able to really do anything effective is if they go to somebody who knows how to do something with that data. That's the second opinion. And they can take it to a researcher. They can take it to another clinical lab. They can take it wherever. And that group will then employ their bioinformatics pipeline, their quality thresholds, their process for deciding what's real and what's not real, and their interpretive process, the whole piece. And that's where, you know, I believe is the kind of right balance right now, but everybody's unfortunately doing a little differently. And, and it's a challenge. So what do you think your obligation is to store that data long term? <laughs> that's a huge, huge yep. data problem. So what we wrote into the ACMG guidelines for next-gen sequencing was that we recommended that either the FASTQ or BAM, and, the, and the, for the BAM, it has to be a BAM that, does, that retains all reads, so you can regenerate the FASTQ, um, has to be stored for two years. Uh, the variant call file, which is, of course, a much smaller file, and the final report should be stored indefinitely. And that's what we recommend, is sort of balance the, the storage issues, um, but you know, wanting to retain every variant you interpreted or called on a patient that you may want to go back to. So that rings true with others. Bharat, do you want to briefly comment on your perspective? Yeah, I, we came to the same conclusion with regarding to this uh, second consult. I mean, if we were to share any data uh, with another lab or with a patient, it's much better to just share the FASTQ files. Um, and that's truly the second opinion. The second opinion isn't really uh, just a reinterpretation of the variants that we called, but to figure out whether those variants are real or not. I mean, that's the process where we have to start. So we, if some, nobody has asked us as yet, but if somebody did, we would share the FASTQ files. Um, and regarding, um, you know, storage of this data, uh, these are uh, CAP recommendations for all lab tests that you share, you know, you store these data for two years, some cases five years. And I think that is something that labs have to think about before they start running a lot of samples, um, which we did not. <laughs> <laughs> but on hindsight, um, you know, we would uh, uh, advise people to think about these aspects uh, before they get lost. That's yes. right. <laughs> I'm curious about the international um, perspective on this, mm -hmm. in that it occurs to me that a lot of these networks that are that you're part of, which are super super impressive, um, they're probably international to an extent, but they seem to rely on personal connections that are probably stronger within a country than between the countries. Mm -hmm. Also, the legal aspects of mm -hmm. all of this are going to be very yeah. different from country to country, I and mean, we see that in drugs, that the mm -hmm. FDA regulates drugs very differently, and you end up with scenarios where, you know, drugs is, is legal in one place. So what are your various networks doing to, mm -hmm. to tackle this? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So, for example, with Gene Insight, we, part of that software is what's called variant wire, where everybody who's using that software gets linked up through a share and share alike network. Now, we, when there's a number of laboratories called the Coger Network in Canada that are on this network, um, and we have the ability to share both case level data as well as variants that are interpreted. 
But the problem is Canada has a law that patient data cannot exit the country. And the cheapest model to support the software is a hosted instance where the, the actual instance of the software is on our own servers at partners. And so we host software you know, through labs around the, the US on the partner servers. We could not do that for the Canadian site because their patient data can't be sitting in our servers in the US. So now it turns out that the prevailing opinion is that variant level data, so here's a variant and this is what I think about it, it's not considered patient data. So we are hosting variant databases for them, but the patient level data, we're going to be setting up servers in Canada to support that. And same thing with like Germany, data cannot come out of Germany. So there's, there's a lot of international laws around both where samples can go as well as where actual patient data can go. And that is why this notion of a federated network is really a, an important one. You know, the way we've set it up for the matchmaker exchange, so we have data in Decipher um, in the UK, but that data stays there and you query it, say, are there any patients with this phenotype and this? And what gets returned is an answer, yes or no. Um, and this is how the match happened, but the patient, the patient data never leaves the actual decipher instance. This is what I think is going to have to happen to enable broad scale international data sharing, but allow for both privacy and international regulatory laws to be not overridden. <laughs> At the same time, you know, it all sounds great, great, federate the world, and everybody share everything. The problem is, having worked on this project for a year and a half now, you know, we sort of, as we looked at how the data was structured in each of these databases, realized there was going to be f absolute failure <laughs> because, like, you know, GEMAP has their data structured with no candidate genes flagged, it's all VCF files, whereas GeneMatcher has you know, candidate gene flags. So the moment you do a query from here to here, it'll hit every, you know, every VCF file because they all have variants in most of those genes. So the structure of that data has to be consistent for these processes to work. Uh, and that is a challenge. There's also circumstances where centralization is a better approach. And if for anybody using the exact data that's from the Broad right now, the reason that is such a high quality data set is they brought 90,000 exomes into one place Turns out they're all sequenced at the Broad, so it was actually easy to do that. Um, and then they did joint calling and used the entire data set to improve the quality of individual calls. So that data set of allele frequencies would not be as, the same if you pulled exomes from 1,800 corners of the world and tried to combine them through VCF files. So you know, similarly, the ba benefit I've just explained from ClinVar by centralizing variant interpretations and comparing those interpretations would be much more difficult if we hadn't gotten all the data structured in the same way, which is what happens in every submission process. So there is a balance here between the benefit of centralization, but the reality and the need for federated networks, and we're going to have to sort of figure out those balances over time. Thanks. Yeah, that's fascinating. It brings questions about national things, yeah. national efforts to do sequencing, too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, we are supposed to go to lunch now. So for those of you who um, are interested, uh, who have registered for lunch, please meet outside the doors, and you'll be uh, directed to lunch. And for everybody else, thank you for coming. And let's thank uh, our speaker, Patty <laughs> Rainey.